Good morning, everyone. I'm cardiologist. My name is Alexander Niesler. I'm from the Medical University of Vienna. And I will start off with some general aspects about clinical trials. Uh, the objectives will be, what is my research question? How do I get the research question? How can I answer the research question? And the last part will be a little bit more technical. What do, you, do I need to conduct the clinical study? First step usually is to do a brainstorming to find out what could be interesting. I could review the existing practice, what could be done better. Um, I can look at long established practice. Practice is the misconception. I can look what I'm discussing with my colleagues and where we disagree and where we have different opinions and to find out where are the gaps uh, of evidence. And also I can look at geographical variations. Are they doing something different in the south than in the north or are there differences and people don't agree how to do it. Once I have the idea, I should challenge the idea. The first thing, do I really want to answer the question? Do I have the motivation? Do I want to do a whole trial to really find out this question? Is it worth it for me personally? I'm motivated. The second thing is, does it have an implication for patient care? Is it clinically relevant or just interesting for me the question? Is it really novel? So did no one answer this question so far? Is it feasible? Can I ask, uh, answer the question? Is there a possibility to answer the question? Is it ethically sound? For example, can I compare two treatment arms? Is it fair to do it? Are they the same? And then, of course, do I have the means to answer the question? Are there the resources available? This is not only financial resources, but also means technical resources. Do I have the patience? Do I have the dedicated staff? And of course, does the field believe me if I want to answer this question? Do I have the expertise to answer the question? So usually discard nine out of 10 ideas. There are enough open other research questions. I recently heard a similar talk from a guy from Harvard. Of course, this guy said discard 99 out of 100 ideas. Then you're even more successful, but then also your chance of failure increases. So I think it's fine to discard nine out of 10, but be selective. Who or what may help you to find out whether your ideas were following it further? It's daily practice, so you should go with your idea, take it with you to daily practice, think, well, would this change something? Ask your senior, senior researchers in your institution, uh, do a literature research, including the guidelines. They identify open question. We'll see an example soon. Is there already a publication with a similar hypothesis out? What would be the difference or the novelty of my study question? Is there something new? And what can I learn from published studies? And of course, you can look at the trial registries uh, like clinicaltrials.gov or the registry from WHO. So here we see an example how to find uh, major gaps. That's the recent guidelines from the ESC on aortic disease, for example. And if you look, uh, they tell us 80% are only consensus decisions, the recommendations, and they indicate a lot of major gaps like more epidemiologic data needed. The value of biomarkers should be clarified. Um, we need more data on accuracy and reproducibility of aortic measurements. We need more data about female patients with aortic disease, for example. So a lot of gaps and the guidelines identify these gaps. How you may, may end up with irrelevant results is also important not to do is this is the uh, typical phishing expedition. So you have a large database and you just search for any significant association without any underlying uh, research question or a question that is easy to answer, but no one is actually interested. So you shouldn't do this, of course. Once you have your idea, you should uh, also uh, do a, or form a research question, your hypothesis, do an exact definition, time, place, which patients, what are the exact aims, and what are the sub-aims. An example, your idea, green apples keep the doctor away. So your research question could be, do green apples prevent myocardial infarction? Your aim is whether green apple per day prevents myocardial infarction in patients with high cardiovascular risk. You, so you exactly define the patients, you define the intervention. And then you have sub-aims, for example, whether green apples lower the risk of myocardial infarction in patients with hypertension or in patients with hypercholesterolemia, for example, or whether the apple intake must be for one month or for 12 months to see something. Or whether green apples prevents ST elevation in uh, myocardial infarction, but not non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Of course, this is just an example to see how you should um, form your questions. So next point is, how can I answer the research question? 
you need a study design. This will be discussed in detail later. You need a study population, you need a defined exposure, and you need an endpoint and a follow-up. The gold standard for interventional trials we'll hear later is the randomized controlled trial. You need a control group for this uh, trial. This should receive the standard therapy if there is a standard therapy or placebo. And the second thing is which you need, you need randomization. Randomization ensures that the treatment groups are only different with regard to the intervention. In the observational study, the different question you can try to answer. The most common question is, is there any association of a risk factor with an outcome? You can do a cohort study. Then you start with the cohort and wait for outcomes to occur. This is not good if it's a rare event, then you usually need a case control study. So if you have a rare event, you start with patients who already have the event and compare them with patients who do not have the event. Or you do a cross-sectional study, there you just uh, determine prevalence of disease and risk factors at the same time. Other aims of an observational study could be just descriptive aims, just, such as the prevalence of disease time trends. And you can also try to compare intervention and observational trial but then you have the danger it's prone to bias and confounding. What is bias and confounding? We'll talk a lot about bias and confounding. That's the enemies of sound research. You have to always be aware uh, to avoid these two problems. Bias is a systematic error that results in a conclusion which is not true. For example, selection bias means patients are not comparable. For example, between the groups or the patients are not comparable with the source population. You could have an information bias then the information is not comparable. For example, if in treatment group A, a patient has an event, and in group B, the same event occurs, it's uh, received differently. So in group A, someone says, yes, that's, that, that's a myocardial infarction, but in group B, the same people say, no, that's not a myocardial infarction. This would be information bias. And then we have confounding. This means that the fact that the is there is a, factor, a confounding factor that affects the effect of the exposure on the outcome. We'll see that in detail soon. There could be positive confounding that what we knew, so the effect seems stronger of the exposure on the outcome, but there could be also the other way that we have negative confounding, so the effect seems weaker. What has bias uh, to do with the study design? We can avoid bias by doing a good study design in an interventional trial. To avoid selection bias, we do a randomization so the groups are comparable. We should adhere to the protocol, so we really have comparable groups, and we should do an intention to treat analyze. We will also come to that later, um, so also the follow-up is similar. We can prevent information bias by blinding both participants and uh, researchers. With regard to the observational study, uh, we should do a good in uh, selection of patients with inclusion-exclusion criteria, so they're representative for the source population. And we could do a matching if we have two groups to make them very similar. With regard to the information bias, we can try to make participants unaware of the study aim, and we can make the researchers classifying endpoints unaware of exposure of individuals. So we can try to also avoid information bias in an observational study. What's about confounding? Here we have an example. Um, we have your data. Uh, from several European countries. We have here the number of stork breeding pairs and we have here uh, the rate, birth rate. And there is a correlation between the number of stork breeding pairs and the number of birth rates. So the question is, does really the stork deliver the babies? We know that's not true, but this statistic uh, seems like it's true. And that's confounding. So we have a relation between the storks and the birth rates. And there has to be something else which distorts this relationship and that's the confounder. And in this case, it was the land area. So countries which had a large land area had a lot of space for storks. And on the other side, these large countries also had a higher birth rate. So this was the confounder. And when in this uh, analysis, there was an adjustment from this count, uh, for this confounder. Then the association between storks and birth rate disappeared. So that's in theory. We have here the exposure. We have the outcome. We have a questionable, questionable association between exposure and outcome. And then we have the confounder, which usually is close, closely associated with the exposure. The confounder has something to do with the outcome also. Another example, which is very important for the cardiovascular field and also for our next break, is coffee and cardiovascular mortality. This is a presentation from 2012, and there's a univariate relationship between coffee and cardiovascular mortality. However, 
when they are adjusted for confounders, such as smoking and other confounders, suddenly this association disappeared. So we are fine, we can drink coffee in the break, it's no problem, and this is confounding. How can sound, a sound study design prevent confounding? That's our topic, how we can prevent it in a study design. In intervention studies, we can avoid it by randomization, and the difference is we can avoid all confounders, also unknown confounders by the study design in an observational trial. We can do an adjustment for known confounders, but just for known confounders and not to them which we don't know. Here we have an example of an observational study and how they dealt with the confounding. This was a post-marketing study about Dabicotran compared to warfarin. It was an observational study. They used the so-called propensity score matching to adjust uh, for confounding, so they made the groups very similar. And they had a great chance to do this because they had a lot of patients. It was more than 100,000 patients and 2,700 outcome events. So they finally made the groups by this propensity score matching very similar. If you look here at the baseline characteristics, they're about exactly the same. If you look at the standardized mean differences, they're always 0 0.00 or 0 0.01. And they did it for a lot of variables. As you see here, it's on two pages, but still you can only match with propensity score matching for known confounders. So if you have some variable which you don't know, which is a confounder, but you don't know, you cannot adjust for in the observation study. <coughs> Next, you think, have to think about your study population. You have to think about your sam sample size, about how many patients you need. Of course, if you have many patients, you need to minimize the error due to play of chance. But also, you have to be, of course, aware of restricted resources. It's very important to do a sample size cal calculation in the beginning so you don't end up after one or two years to find out that you don't have enough patients to really answer your questions. You should think about external validity in your study population. So what is the source population? What is the study population representative for? Can the results then afterwards be translated to the general population? Or do I specifically want to address a high-risk group to ensure a sufficient number of events? Or do I want to address a specific subgroup which nobody has looked at so far, like women or elderly people? Sample size calculation, it's important to look at different scenarios. There are two important variables. That's the rate of the events. For example, here we have mortality rate between 10 and 50% and the risk you want to observe. So for example, here we have a hazard ratio between 1.5, so 50% increase of risk and to a threefold increase of risk. If you want only to see a threefold increase of risk and have a event rate of 50%, you're fine. You just need 63 people. However, if you want also to see a 50% increase of the risk and your event rate is only 10%, you already need more than 3,000 people. You also need to uh, think about an alpha. If you do a sample size calculation, which is similar to your p-value of 0 0.05, your significance level, and you need also to think about the power, which usually is between 80 and 90%, which is the likelihood that you really get a significant result. So assess different scenarios, get the feeling of the relevant factors, play around and get the feeling what may change or what numbers you really need. And then think about, do you have enough patients at my institution? And if not, you need to think about a multi-center trial. About inclusion and exclusion criteria, there's always a very difficult discussion. Who to include and exclude in a study? If you're very strict, you have a well-defined study population, makes the effect more predictable, you have a high internal validity, and it's safer, you can exclude high-risk patients if you uh, test a new intervention. But it is difficult to recruit patients you have increasing costs, the time of recruitment and risk of the failure of the study increases. If you have broad in, in and exclusion criteria, you increases your external validity, so um, it's valid for a broad range of people, and it facilitates, of course, the recruitment of patients. And you have to be aware, already by selecting your study site, you select the patient. So if you take a tertiary center, you have to be aware that you have a highly selected group of patients already. Let's see an example that's from the real life trial which uh, compared Dabicatran to Warfarin. And of course, the investigators wanted to exclude high risk patients. So if you look here at point three, sorry, it's very small there. Uh, they say uh, condition, condition associated with increased risk of bleeding are excluded, for example, major surgery within previous month, history of major, uh, major bleeding, gastrointestinal hemorrhage are excluded, 
hemorrhagic disorders are excluded, um, fibrinolytic agents, of course, are excluded, uncontrolled hypertension. So they had a very strict inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria to really uh, avoid high-risk patients. And you see that's a long list of exclusion criteria. So you also have to be aware, if you take these results, to which patient you can translate these results. There's another study, the Jupiter trial. Uh, this was also famous. They wanted to have patients with a high cholesterol and with high sensi sensitivity C-reactive protein. And they uh, screened uh, almost 90,000 of people and they ended up with 17,000 of people. So the question, of course, is for which patient these results are valid because they are very selected and they had a very long time of enrollment to find these patients. So this is an example of a study with very strict in and exclusion criteria. You also need to think about your exposure. You see there is always the same word, this is standardization. You think, how can I standardize the measurement of my exposure? For example, in intervention, you need to think about the dose, about the duration for biologic measurement of the standardized measurement of the biologic measurement. The most difficult point is the last one. If you want to assess the history of belief, you need standardized questionnaires or interviews. But this would take another hour to explain this. You have to think about endpoints and the follow-up. If you want to look at the clinical endpoint, you have to be aware that's more reliable, but sometimes rare and difficult to assess. If you want to rely on a surrogate endpoint, you need a smaller sample size. But on the other side, you have to make sure that the surrogate endpoint is a valid measurement of the ultimate, usually clinical endpoint. You also have to think how you do the follow-up because this is very time-consuming and needs a lot of resources. So now we're in the last part, that's the more technical part. It's about study protocol, data acquisition, statistic, funding and resources, the study site, ethics, study registration, study reporting. Where's the asterisk? These topics will be discussed later on. You need always to have a study protocol that's like your schedule and you have to say before what you want to do and not to write it afterwards. There have to be different contents of a study protocol. Of course, you need a title and the authors. You need a rationale for your study, so why you have done this. The research question aims and sub-aims, the study design, study location, study population, the definition of exposure and outcome, the statistical analysis, ethical consideration, data acquisition, study flow, logistic and resources. So about the data acquisition, the aim of course is to have complete, correct and standardized recording of key data. This sounds easy, but it's not easy in practice. Which information do you need? You need to have the exposure data, you need to have uh, potential confounding variables, and you need to have uh, your endpoints. You have different sources like data from standardized data acquisition. You should already code the answers in the standardized data forms. That's very important if you uh, want to translate the data afterwards to databases. You have to think about questionnaires. That's the most difficult part with predefined questions to minimize the bias of uh, reporting. This question should encourage, of course, complete data acquisition and they need to be validated. So that's really a difficult task. Biometric measurements should, of course, take aware of measurement errors like inter and intra assay variability. Just some general statistical consideration. Where can I find the st gold standard for my question? That's different because each question is a different approach for st statistical analysis. You can look at the instru instru instruction for authors of journals, for example. For example, if you want to investigate polymorphisms, there are very specific recommendations how to address this topic, and you see how the journals want you to deal with these questions. You can look at reporting standards. We will see this concert statements, which is for interventional studies. You need to think about your descriptive study. You need to think about your analysis of relationship between exposure and outcome. Do you think there's a causal relationship? Do I need a univariate analysis? Do I need a multivariate analysis? Do I need a time-dependent or independent analysis? Do I need an external validation? And then which patients are analyzed and which patient times are analyzed? There could be an on-treatment analysis, which means that I just analyze the time when the patient takes the intervention, or intention to treat, which means I uh, analyze all times of patients, regardless if the patient takes the treatment or not. I need to think about the resources. Do I have sufficient number of patients? We already have seen the sample size calculation. I think about the multicenter trial if I do not have enough patients. I do have to think if I have sufficient personal with dedicated time. Do I have sufficient financial resources, of course? 
and to have the resources for the whole study period. Very often people start with a study, they're very enthusiastic, and after two years they don't have any more people, and they don't have any more resources, and they don't have enough patients included. You should register your study. I already showed you these two uh, websites for study registration, the clinicaltrials.gov and the WHO. Study registration is required for interventional studies. They should, should avoid publication bias, so prevent that only positive results are published. And it should also avoid double conduct of the same study. And in the perfect, it would be perfect if you find even partners who have the same idea and want to follow the same question. And you should also foster the predefinition of analysis. So it should prevent that you make fishing experiments and already say in advance what analysis you want to perform. So let me summarize, before you start the adventure of a clinical trial, you should challenge the idea you want to follow. You should check your resources, do you have enough resources? You should have the adequate expertise and the field should believe you that you can answer the question and you always should have a study protocol. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>